Well, hallelujah, I am free. Jesus, Jesus gives me victory. Glory, glory, hallelujah. He is all and all to me. Sing victory. Oh, victory. Sweet victory. Sweet victory. Hallelujah, I am free. Jesus gives me victory. Glory, glory, hallelujah. He is all and all to me. Yes, he is all and all to me. Yes, he is all. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you for the blood. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you for victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory, 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 glory. Praise God. Jesus, hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Like a choir, come on. Oh, it is Jesus. Thank you, Lord, Master. Touch, heal, bring deliverance. Glory to God.
consumed with the issue of blood. Mark 5, tried and she tried to come to Jesus. She pressed through the crowd and touched him that day. Virtue flowed out of Jesus and touched her. Now she walks every bit whole. Sing now. Well, oh, it is Jesus. Yes. Wonderful Jesus. Hallelujah. It is Jesus in my soul. Oh, I have touched the hem of His garment, and His blood has made me whole. Come on, sing it again. Lift your hands and just let God touch you tonight as only He can do. Oh, it is Jesus, wonderful Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus in my soul. My soul. Hallelujah. Rejoice together. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus. <clears throat> Before you're seated, get out and find at least a half dozen dear people to shake their hand and uh, welcome them tonight. Thank you, singers, musicians, magicians, <clears throat> everybody. Glory. We welcome everybody tonight. How many of you have come expecting God to do something for you? Yes. I am. Hallelujah. Now, we're, we're here for one reason, and that is to prepare our hearts for 
the soon coming of Jesus. I don't personally believe that an average person that goes to church, and by average I'm talking about they're faithful to come, and nowadays, according to some research, faithfulness is they may make it out once every other week. Can you imagine? Uh, Christians that claim to serve the Lord, and yet the Bible plainly says that we're to forsake not the assembling of ourselves so much the more as that end approaches. That phrase, so much the more, doesn't mean as little as you can get by with. It means as much as you can come together. My father, before he died and when he was still able to speak, he told us, boys, he said, the day's coming. He said, I'm not a prophet, but I say it. When the church will be open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Because he says, as things grow worse and worse, people will turn to Christ like never before. A lot of times, people like to quote the verse that in the latter times, many shall depart from the faith, forgetting that the Bible also speaks of a great outpouring of the Spirit, where every nation shall be visited. I've put that word up on this uh, little board here. We stole it from the children's church. Uh, but I wrote in blue, it's not really that visible, but it's the word nations, nations. <clears throat> and so we're going to work together tonight to build uh, sort of an understanding for all of us uh, about Bible prophecy. And so our uh, folks that are working the computer, I use King James, same Bible Jesus used. And uh, so, but for sure, you know, I don't use the NIV. They've deleted over 28 scriptures, just the New Testament alone, not even in there. So anybody takes away, the Bible said they're cursed. So enjoy your NIV somewhere else. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, I, who is that? Sister Mary running the keyboard. So it'll be the King James. Is that all right with you? Go to Matthew 24, everybody, please. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Last, was it last week I, I dealt with what we call God's timeline? How many were here for that? You remember that where we talked about from the first coming of Jesus to his second coming and the birth of Israel as a nation, the outpouring of the Spirit, of course. But look at this, Matthew 24, if you have your Bible. I want to begin reading, if I may. With verse 4, when Jesus answered his disciples, he had just told them the temple would be destroyed. He also told them that there wouldn't be one stone left upon another. And uh, he said to them a prophetic word. Jesus himself operated in prophecy. Now, I want to make a correction in the understanding of some about the prophet's ministry. The Old Testament prophet is not the same thing as the New Testament office of a prophet. In the Old Testament, the anointing was released through three main and in particular uh, anointings. The anointing of the king, the anointing of the priest, and the anointing of the prophet. And so in the Old Testament, the spirit, the Bible says, came Upon them, upon them. Say that with me. I help you to remember. Say, the Spirit came upon them. When Israel sought to have a king 
And Saul was sought out before he was a king. He was prophesying when the Spirit came upon him in that valley. It's possible that Saul missed his assignment. Saul probably, because of his relationship with Samuel, I believe that it was possible that Saul was to be a prophet in the Old Testament. But he became the king. But he was not a good king. And he ended up consulting familiar spirits and getting involved in the realm of darkness, which is certainly not the kingdom of God. So we need to understand it's not where you start, but it's where you finish when it comes to the things of God. It's like running a race. Some people are a good starter, but they don't have that kick it gear to finish the race and win it. In the Old Testament, not only were the kings anointed, as was David, when the Lord said to Samuel, fill thine horn with oil and go under the house of one Jesse. They brought all of the sons of Jesse before Samuel, but he had a knowing, you're not the one. You're not the one. Till he went through all of the sons that Jesse had presented to him. Do you remember the question Samuel asked of Jesse? Is there not another? Because you see, Samuel knew God told him that there would be one of the sons of Jesse that would be anointed to be the king of Israel. But after going through all of the sons and knowing by only the works of God that this is not the one, he had to ask the question, is there yet another? And of course, Jesse, the father, in some ways, looked down on his youngest son that was born of his second wife because David's mother was not the mother of the other men. And uh, Jewish history tells us Jesse's first wife died. He took upon himself another wife, and he ended up having two, uh, two wonderful things happen to him, which was in history, Jewish history, that that wife died. Amen. But they think that David was perhaps another son, much like the story of Joseph and Benjamin, who were of another mother. That's all uh, Jewish history. The Bible's sort of silent on it, so I like to be too. But I want to draw a point from that. A lot of times, you have something that people are overlooking. That's the point I wanted to make. People, the Bible says, man looks on the outward. But God, our God, looks upon the heart. And so don't feel discouraged. Don't feel like you've missed it. Don't feel as if you're out of position because somebody does not give you recognition. Because at the end of the day, it's God who looks at the heart of men and of women. And he rules in utter, what I call, uh, uh, without question, uh, utter simplicity in that I don't believe God makes his call hard to know. But once you're called, I believe God makes it as hard as possible for you to get away from that call. It pulls on you. It will draw you. Can you say amen? The reason you're here tonight and not sitting out in the backyard with the sun shining is something pulled you here to receive from God. And so we commend you for that. Amen. I wish even more were here. But thank God we're here to receive from the Lord what he has prepared for us. But understand clearly where I'm at, and that is that there were different anointings released in the Old Testament than there are today. And it was the anointing of the kings, the priests, the Aaronic uh, priesthood, Aaron, the brother of Moses, and then, of course, the prophets, Samuel being a prophet. And so there are some Bible scholars that feel that Saul was the people's choice, but David was God's choice. Are you listening to me? 
And so many times people can miss it. And they can miss it even in the crucifixion of Christ. The Bible says, the crowd said to uh, the ruler, Pontius Pilate, uh, crucify him. The crowd, the majority, wanted Jesus to die. But were they right in what they said? No, because Christ is not only God's son, but it was how God chose to pull down the strongholds of the devil that not only were present in that day, but through Jesus, he is still pulling down strongholds around the world. And what you're seeing right now on, in the news and on the feeds of social media and even some of our newspapers, you're watching God align the nations and pull down strongholds because the devil will never have the upper hand. And so what you're seeing now is the beginning. I'm not saying it is, but it's possible that we're seeing the beginning of what God spoke about when Jesus first prophesied about the beginning of the end and answered the question of these disciples when he said, when you see these things, now let's look at it again. The word of God, Matthew 24. And uh, I want to read these, even though I read them last time. I think it helps us. And it's up on the board, beginning with where the Lord Jesus answered and said, let's start there. And the Lord Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Now look at verse six. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Everybody say, the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nations. Now, if you've read your Bible, and most of you I'm sure have read through your Bible, if not, I'm working through it again myself. I've read the New Testament through many times. Sometimes I'd fast and pray and read the whole New Testament while I was fasting and praying. I need to get back to that. Amen. But you get great revelation the more you study the Word of God. But Ezekiel was known as the prophet to the nations. And we read in particular, if you have your Bible, Ezekiel chapter 38. The Word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. So Gog is a ruler. Gog, uh, Gog speaks of a ruler, and the land is called Magog. Uh, let me uh, write that down with that green one. <laughs> I can see it a little bit better. I hope you can. And so Ezekiel prophesied to nations. And the nations, he addressed the leadership, Gog, and the land of what? Magog here. He goes on to speak this prophetic word, and I want you to look at it with me. He says to him, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, but notice the words, and prophesy against him. Everybody say him. So Gog is a person. And the Bible says, literally, he's referred to in that realm of being a person over a land, which is Magog. But to identify that land, there are two cities in that land that are mentioned. Everybody say Meshach. And what's the other one? Tubal. What is it? Meshach and Tubal. Wouldn't that be great if you had twins? Meshach and Tubal. Now they have it up on the screen, so for you that are able to 
read this with us and then uh, uh, it's CH. I think my wife is helping me with my uh, <laughs> my spelling. M-E-S-H. There we go. Get rid of the C. H-E-C-H. There we go. It's not a word I use every day in my language. Honey, get me a piece of toast and Meshach while you're at it. Hallelujah. <laughs> but uh, these are identified as cities in that region. Now, in about 1868, a world map was drawn. I've seen it. I don't have a copy of it. I couldn't afford it. The map itself or copies of itself for over $100,000. But this particular map, when you look at the nation of Russia, underneath the word Moscow, in parentheses, is Meshach. And underneath the name uh, Tobolsk, where the Russian submarine base is, in parentheses, is the word Tubal. And so, in my mind, when we're talking about this region, obviously, the prophet is talking about Russia. And Russia plays a great role in God's end time plan. I think this is on, is this going out live? Facebook, all right. I can't say everything I know, but I'll tell you this much. There are some leaders in Russia right now who have met with a preacher friend of mine. And one of the, it's not that I forget it, I'm just wondering how much I should say. But one of the things that has been a, a door opened to our brother is the ability to broadcast the gospel all across Russia. I'm talking about right now while you're sitting here, deals are being worked on that in every major city in Russia, there will be a channel on their cable and TV uh, networks that will be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, gospel preaching. Isn't that wonderful? And I don't want to say a lot, but I've been looking into uh, getting on that and every week preaching. I was on in Russia for five years on another network out of Kazakhstan. But when the Bible says... The gospel will be preached to all the world. All the world means all the nations of the world. No matter where they figure in later in Bible prophecy, it does not rob them of the opportunity of hearing the good news of who Jesus is and what he can do. Can you say amen? In our own nation, New York City, is one of the hardest cities to get on television and preach the gospel. There are actually places in Russia where it's easier to get on television than it is in New York City. Why? Because the world is not our friend. And the world is not trying to promote the gospel. And that's even true of our nation. But thank God for every church, every Christian, every one of you that are praying and believing God for an end time revival, that God will turn America around, that God will turn the world into what he wants it to be before his coming. There's nowhere in the Bible that says the devil gets to write the last chapter of what God is doing. But thank God we have the ability to be anointed and to do work for God and to be used of God in this final thrust into the nations of the world. Now, one of the characteristics, right now I'm staying with the thought of nations, one of the characteristics that's going on is that there is a working of evil to put nations against nations. The word nations in the gospel is the word ethnos. It's where we get our word ethnicity. And so when you see racism, 
that raises its ugly head in our nation and other nations. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. He's saying there will be ethnic groups that will come against other ethnic, ethnic groups, black versus white. Are you hearing me? Uh, he's talking about the Serbians and the division that was there in that nation and the Civil War. It's the devil's plan to pit people against each other. One of the things we need to guard against in this hour is the working of the enemy that would cause us to harbor some kind of spirit that is anti another group. Whenever you speak about uh, against any group, let's just say there's a group of people on the earth called Charlie Posts. They're everywhere, the Charlie Posts people. But then I don't like the Charlie Post people, and the Charlie Post doesn't like the Ted Shuttlesworth people, and so we begin to engage in that area of conflict. And the Bible says, literally, that Jesus came for the whole world. There is no group that is exempt from the power of God. But, and remember this, when you speak against any other group, then you have disqualified yourself to be able to minister the gospel to them. Are you hearing me? Because as my dad preached for years, everybody is somebody to Jesus. Hallelujah. So we need to guard our hearts against this area of uh, prejudice and racism. And right now, uh, on social media, one of the biggest things that's raising its ugly head is what we would call anti-Semites uh, or anti-Semitism, where people are speaking against Israel, speaking against the Jewish people. But remember what God said about that people. He said, they're the apple of my eye. That when you bless them, God said in Genesis, then I will bless you. When you curse them, then a curse comes upon you. And so of all the peoples on the earth that we want to bless, especially should we have the mindset, we want to bless Israel. I don't know if it's still here, but yeah, here it is. There used to be this uh, 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 flag flying over that way, and they've moved all the flags. But let me, uh, I hope this is the right one. Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, come along. I'll, I'll put you back later. Amen. There you go. What is this the flag of? The nation of? Let me tell you the story about when we started doing this. The Spirit of the Lord moved upon my brother, Pastor Tim, and he felt to... Uh, begin to honor Israel. And uh, I don't see Brother Rocky here, but his family plays into this. But when my brother felt to do this, to honor the nation of Israel, he got a hold of Joe Manchin, who then was our governor, talked to him about the blessing that comes on a state, a people, a nation, when they honor Israel. Sister Jessica may know a little about this, maybe more than I do. She was helping uh, the governor at the time. But uh, Governor Manchin reached out to Israel, and they had a representative come here. And uh, some people blamed his uncle, A.J., I don't know. I always heard it was the young guy that was uh, sleeping on duty that missed it. But a lot of money was lost uh, because they were one day too late in releasing funds that was on Wall Street, and as a result, uh, West Virginia got hit, and we began to deal with extreme debt. But Brother, uh, Brother uh, Tim, Pastor Tim, it's funny because I, I still call him, uh, well, Brother Tim, amen, whatever, but uh, Pastor Tim, he got a hold of the governor, and they went to a revival meeting together in Charleston at the Civic Center. How many have heard this story? Okay, I'll tell it again. And the governor sat next to my brother, and the speaker was preaching the gospel. And the governor said, I know about some of this stuff, but not from the Bible. He knew about it from his political collect, uh, connections as these things were being set up. So he asked to hold pastor's Bible, which pastor did, and showed him the scriptures. It wasn't long after that we struck a deal with 
uh, the nation of Israel and begin to work. And within just a short time, West Virginia was completely out of debt. And not only that, had money in the bank, which we have to this day. That came from the promise of God about those that will uh, uh, bless the nation of Israel. How many of you wouldn't mind if God blessed you more than what you have now? Even Brother Noah's thinking about it. Amen. We always want God to bless us more. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not a selfish spirit. But in the midst of what we're dealing with as a people, we have to remind ourselves that we're living now in that time since Jesus prophesied about nations that there is an increase an increase of two things, deception, and then again, the word that the world uses, terror. And so in Timothy, Paul said to his son in the gospel that, uh, know ye not, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Everybody say that with me. Perilous times shall come. So if you look that word up, get you a weiss word study or something, you'll find the word means terror. And so one of the prophetic things about the time we're living in will be an increase of terrorism. Are you listening to me? The concern that I have is we've allowed so many people in this nation in the last 18 months, and we don't know who they are, and uh, we don't know where they're from, what they represent, that we're not only dealing with an enemy from without, but now we're dealing with an enemy that's within. And so what does the church do? What does the child of God do? And because you can see a ramping up prophetically of what's going on in the nation of Israel, then that means everything that is increasing that was prophesied is at work right now for every one of us. So we can't be like the proverbial ostrich and stick our head in the sand and say it'll all be over someday, praise the Lord. No, the Bible says we're to occupy until Jesus comes. We're not to draw back like them that are of uh, 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 what we would call perdition or have allowed sin and unbelief, but we're to set our face like a rock. And the Bible speaks of that flinty look, that flinty face that says, I'm not putting up with the devil's mess. I've got to occupy in the midst of all these prophetic things that are going on. I'm here. I'm believing God till my children are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm here till the devil takes his hands off my body if you're dealing with a physical problem. I'm going to set my face. I'm not moving until I see the results of what God has promised in his word. It belongs to me and prophetically I am the church. Hallelujah. And the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. You're already on the winning side. You're already a conqueror. You're already more more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. We should act like that. Be encouraged to know God has not forsaken his people. And I'm going to tell you, he's not forsaken America. Hallelujah. My confession is America shall be saved. You believe that? Ezekiel 38, if you're still with me. In uh, the summer of 2022, the Lord spoke to me about Israel. I wrote this book back in, and it was published by, I don't know when, Sister Odessa, but at least November of that fall we were, uh, of 22, we were offering it. But uh, when I wrote it, the Lord gave me this thought, the coming invasion of Israel. We offered it, maybe, a thousand. I had my son check. We had 2,500 copies printed. According to Sister Tina, we're down to 301. Is that right? She's exact. You got to watch her. She don't get, let you get away with anything. Amen. So I know <clears throat> there's at least 2,100 of these books floating around the nation and then the downloads around the world. However that, many that is, I don't know. I would need Chris's help or Teddy. But Ezekiel 38 speaks 
of a time when Israel will be invaded. As you know, just a short while ago, Hamas parachuted into Israel and the soldiers that parachuted in were shooting people with their machine guns on the ground before they ever landed. Hundreds were already hit by bullets and then later, even to this day, over a hundred and some are being held hostage. This is what's happening right now is not something we're surprised about. This has been an ongoing increase of Bible prophecy in front of your eyes. Now, here's the question. What will you do? How then will you live in light of what's going on? So the first chapter, I called it the prophecy generation because there will be a generation on the earth that Ezekiel, Daniel, Jesus himself, later we read it, in the writings of Jude and different ones in the New Testament, there is a time that God, by his Spirit, is moving in such a way, the one prophet said, it'll be like the waters that cover the sea. It's going to be massive what God does. This right now, in my opinion, is a distraction for those of us that know we've got a job to do. Our job is to win the lost. Our job is to preach the gospel and not sit around with the pundits from Fox News and ABC and CBS and try to figure out what does this mean for the world. The Bible already told you what it means. The Bible said it. Now, what would be the chance that the exact nations that Ezekiel prophesied over 2,000 plus years ago are the three nations that are actively being mentioned on your news last week and this week. That's a pretty good uh, guess, if you want to call it a guess. No, God told Ezekiel that there would come an alliance, and in particular, we'll start with this, Russia. But then it goes on to say Persia will be a part, Ethiopia and Libya. Now, or Libya, or Libya, or Libya. My wife always, how do you say Soviet Union, amen. She says Soviet, amen. I call it Soviet, praise God. Is that all right? Okay, I've passed that test, glory. There will be a rise of Islam because Togomar and Persia and Ethiopia and Libya are all Muslim nations. And so there's going to be an increase of activity that Ezekiel prophesied as you read on, verse uh, 5 tells us the list of these nations. The first one is what? Persia. The next one is what? Ethiopia. And the third one is? What? You talk to my wife, see if that passed. All right. Persia, in Bible days, is what now is represented by Iran and Iraq. Previous to World War II, there was a young lieutenant in the British Army. You may have heard of him. His name was Winston Churchill. His assignment was to redefine the boundaries of Persia. So what Churchill did, he went to the Bible, and he looked at the rivers that are mentioned there between what we would call Israel and Persia. He looked at all of these things, and uh, in those days, the Muslims were divided into the Shiites and the Sunnis, two different groups. So what he did was he divided Persia, and so there's Iraq, which is one of those groups, which I believe is called the Sunni. North of that, right up to Turkey, is the Shiites, and Togomar is the old world term for what we now call modern-day Turkey. And so we see that Islam or Muslims play a tremendous part in end-time Bible prophecy. For the Word of God says there will come a day when these people shall invade the land of Israel. 
And when they do, their army shall come with them. Now here's the question that we need to understand. Is this what we're seeing the beginning of Ezekiel 38? Or is it what the Bible calls in Revelation, and they all gather together in the valley of Megiddo, in the Hebrew meaning Armageddon, is what we're seeing the beginning of Armageddon? Is this Ezekiel 38's prophecy? Now let me just say this. It cannot be the battle of Armageddon you're watching because the temple has not yet been restored and built. According to the Bible, this Antichrist, three and a half years into the tribulation, will go into the temple and he will blaspheme and like Antichus uh, 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 Epiphanes, I guess is how you say it, offered pigs in the temple before Israel the first time was destroyed by Roman armies, there will be this area of a sacrifice that blasphemes, mocks God. And so that has not happened and it can happen it cannot happen until the temple is rebuilt. John Hagee has many friends through his Christians United for Israel group, and he was invited by Netanyahu to Israel. One of the top rabbis escorted him around and said to him, we have the Ark of the Covenant. And they took him down under the old diggings in the city. They wouldn't take him next to it. They just, down the corridor, he said, you could see where there was something there covered. But they treat that as a holy treasure. Brother Higgy said to some of the people, Tom Pete's one of my buddies, he said, I don't know if people believe me, but he said, that's what they told me. But I believe him, and I'll tell you why. I always get into interesting things since the Lord's been using me. I was in Atlanta preaching, and Mary Cuffton, he'll be here the week after. That's wherever the picture went. That's him. Uh, that was like a good segue where you could put the picture back up for camp meeting. There we go. It's coming. Electricity is a wonderful thing. But... On this picture, I want you to see the camp meeting picture as they come out of the scriptures for a minute. Uh, Brother Houghton is a great missionary. He's a son of a missionary. He's been into over 78 nations of the world. But he's the gentleman down at the bottom corner. Uh, and his name is Merrick Houghton. If you can at all come on Friday afternoon or morning when he preaches, always it's a good time. He has a great word. He's been in over 78 nations. He's even been in Russia, China, preached the gospel, multiplied thousands upon thousands have been saved. He has a true missionary's heart, like William Carey of old that went to India. He said, I want you to come down and preach. I went down to preach. He said, Brother Shuttlesworth, you've lost weight. I said, thanks for noticing. He said, I'm going to buy you some clothes. I said, well, let the Lord use you. Amen. Because <laughs> my wife had just said, you need new clothes. And uh, some of you that are new to the church, you don't remember. I used to weigh 362 pounds. And sometimes they would fly me over the West Virginia games and I would be an advertisement. Amen. <laughs> a blimp. It'll come to you on the way home. Amen. <laughs> the Lord helped me to lose weight. Thank the Lord. And uh, I did need clothes. So we go into this store. I think it's called Joseph Banks. You know where you buy one suit, get 27 free. We went into Joseph Banks. When I walked in, the anointing came on me. I mean, the Spirit of God, I could feel him touching me. And you know what the Lord said to me? He said, see that young man over there? I said, yes, Lord. He said, he guarded the Ark of the Covenant. I thought, what? He's in Atlanta. The Ark is in Atlanta. I didn't know. <laughs> So I leaned over to Brother Houghton. I said, you see that brother back there? I said, he, the Lord shows me he guarded the Ark of the Covenant. Brother Houghton goes, what? <laughs> if you've ever been around him, that's a beautiful imitation. 
What? All right, that's it. Casey's watching. We walked over, and he was waiting on somebody, selling him a suit. And I said, uh, you used to live in Ethiopia, and you guarded the Ark of the Covenant. I just blurted it out. <laughs> Brother Huffman's watching. The young man looks at me. First thing he said to us, are you guys FBI? <laughs> he said, let me wait on this guy. I must talk to you. He waited on him. He came over. He said, yes, I am from Ethiopia, but I live here in Atlanta now. He said, why would you say I guarded the Ark of the Covenant? I said, because the Lord told me it did. I'm not backing down now. I'm halfway in. Might as well jump the whole way in. Amen. You heard about the guy that died? He wrote, wrote that song, the hokey pokey. Amen. When they went to bury him, they had to put the left foot in and then the right foot. He kept getting out. But anyhow. See, that's a good one, isn't it? He'll tell that in school tomorrow and get thrown out. So he starts talking to us, Brother James. He says, uh, I, I used to be a part of the guard. And he named the town, the church. He said, we've always been told the Ark of the Covenant was in the basement of that holy site. And he said, yes, I was told I was one of the guards that guarded the Ark of the Covenant. We were able to witness to him, and to this day, he's still our friend. When I come in, he always looks around, and I think he's afraid of what I'm going to see. Amen. But anyhow, that night, <clears throat> before I go to church, I get a call from Rich Wilkerson, who lives in Miami, Florida. Back then, Jan Crouch, when she was alive, she would sometimes have... Rich host the Praise the Lord program on TBN. So he called me. He said, I need your help. I said, well, I can't come. I'm in Atlanta. No, no, no. He said, the former prime minister of Ethiopia is going to be here tonight, and I'm supposed to interview him. What would you ask him, Brother Ted? Now, remember, that afternoon, I've been talking to the young Ethiopian in the, in the suit shop. I said, well, if you want to make international news, I can tell you what to ask him. Oh, yeah, what is it? I said, uh, tell him I know the Ark of the Covenant, and I remember the city at the time uh, is in the basement of that holy site. And Rich, again, if you knew him, he go, wow. Some people are, what? Others are, wow, amen. So he gets in the green room that night in the Station there in Pembroke Pines. And the prime minister comes in with a bodyguard. And they greet each other. And Rich Wilkerson said, would you like to discuss the Ark of the Covenant tonight? He said that man got a funny look in his face. Asked his bodyguards to step out of the room. And he said, why would you ask of me this thing? And Brother Rich said, uh-oh, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> he said, well, I would like to know. He said, I had a friend call me today from Atlanta. He talked to a young man that was a guard at such and such a church where they believe the ark is in the basement of that holy site. And the prime minister said to him, former prime minister, we're not being filmed, no. He said, this night, while I'm here in America, we're moving the ark to Israel. Right now, it's being transported to the nation of Israel. And that was some 10 plus years ago. I don't know why God lets me see these things or know about them. But I do believe that God wants to lead us so specifically that we're not taken unawares of the day we're living in. And already I've had people call, is this the battle of Ezekiel 38 and so forth? Is this it? Is this the end? And I would have to say to you, number one, it is not the battle of Armageddon because the temple has not been rebuilt. Uh, rebuilt. And so take that out of your mind for a moment. Revelation speaks of the battle of Armageddon. I've been to the valley of Megiddo. I, I, I've actually walked there on the plains of it with uh, my father and different ones. And it's going to be a terrible thing when there will be mass destruction. 
And the Bible says the blood will run clear up to the horse's bridles. So many will be killed in that final end time battle. But this is not, this is not the battle of Armageddon that you're seeing to unfold. I remember years ago, uh, some of you wouldn't even know the name, but I'll mention it anyhow. His name was David Wilkerson. And he uh, finished his days pastoring in New York City. He was a friend of my father. He used to pastor in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. My dad was in Harrisburg. And Brother Wilkerson would come down and preach for dad. And he always had a prophetic touch in his life. But he said there will be some kind of an event that will have to destroy the Muslim mosque that is on the mount there in Jerusalem where they celebrate and we've been there too, uh, where God told Abraham to offer his son up. And uh, the Muslims have built a mosque over that rock and it's considered one of their three holy sites. But for the temple, now the old temple wall is still there. And I've watched the Jewish people go and pray and put their prayer requests in little notes in the cracks of the rock and uh, calling on the God of Israel to help them. But where the mosque sits would be where the rest of the temple would have to be. As some of you may or may not know, about uh, seven years ago, back in 2017, all of the components to build the temple have now been brought to Israel. They're all ready to build. The only obstacle would be the mosque would have to be removed. In that it is a holy site for the Muslim people and one of the top three, Mecca being number one and so forth, there would be a massive war. And so Brother Wilkerson felt something may happen where that temple would be destroyed. So yesterday when they were saying that it was amazing how the Iron Dome of Protection that 300 drones and uh, ballistic missiles were launched at Israel, but the Iron Dome uh, kept all but 10 from hitting the ground. That's pretty good. What's sad is America, we designed and invented the Iron Dome, and the drones and the missiles coming against them, we designed those too. And our people are telling us that some were the weaponry that was left behind in Afghanistan. Be that as it may, God has a plan. Everybody say nations. Say it again, nations. Every nation has a spiritual DNA in them that God has put there for a specific purpose. Now, although America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy, what you and I need to understand is this that the nations of the world were literally on the mind of God when he sent Jesus, his son, to suffer and bleed and die on the cross, that God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Sometimes what the devil's doing is a distraction to get your mind and your thinking away from the main thing. The main thing is to preach the gospel to every nation. In the Great Commission, in Matthew, in Mark, and as we read the gospels, we're to take the gospel, go you into all the world, and preach the gospel. One translation says creature, another says nation, Peoples is another translation, but the main thing is the job of the church is to get the gospel to every man, woman, boy, and girl that we can. And not always what you're hearing in the media is the truth. We understand there's propaganda. There are lies that are told. But that Bible that you read and that Bible that you've prayed over and that Bible that you've studied, it cannot fail. If God said it, he's got to do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. Every word of God will come to pass in your life. The Bible says he'll honor his word above 
his name and these prophetic scriptures that we're just really glossing over tonight, they will come to pass. God has a plan for Israel. And the Bible says they're the apple of his eye and the fig tree. When you see it blossom in the latter days, the Bible says you will be visited by these enemy nations. Think about that. Thousands of years ago. And so the beginning, the first excursion of this problem we're seeing now start with Hamas, who are being funded by Iran. Sometime today, I haven't heard the recent news, but Netanyahu and his defense minister, they're going to determine what their response is going to be to Iran. Whether that was already made or not, I don't know unless some of you have heard. They flew them on what is called the doomsday plane. Got, got all the cabinet members, prime minister, and they flew them out of Israel, circling around. We had two ships that come through the Strait of Hormuz, and those ships also in the Mediterranean. The U.S. Navy was at work. And those ballistic missiles were not shot down, we found out this afternoon, by Israel. But it was the United States Navy that destroyed them that were targeted for Jerusalem and would have hit the Dome of the Rock. Somehow God intervened. And those, what was it, six or seven ballistic missiles are two old ships. They say, one guy I saw comment, and he said, I can't believe it's still in service. But if God's going to use you for something, he can keep you going until he's done with you. Hallelujah. David said, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. So don't ever allow the area of discouragement to come on you because you feel like you're too old or you've been at it too long. But thank God, God renews our youth like the eagle. I'm telling you, we need to just gear up and get ready. I don't know what's about to happen. I don't know what will happen. I just know that God holds this world in the palm of his hand. Yes, many people say, well, if he's so good, why are their problems, but they forget. There's a devil that has to be dealt with, and if the church does not use her authority, the devil has a free hand. But when the church of the Lord Jesus stands up and draws a line in the prophetic sand and says, devil, this far and no further, why do you think he can't do what he wants to do till we're gone? Why do you think the Antichrist can't present himself till the church is removed? It's because we have power and authority to rule and to reign with Christ in this world, not like a king or a priest or a prophet of the Old Testament, but the writer of Revelation says, now we are made kings and priests unto God through our authority and our praying. So it is linked together. And then one more thing, if you have your Bible. I want to talk 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, please. For the Lord himself, I'm a little quicker than the computer, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel. With the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Just before my mama passed, she asked me to quote this scripture to her at least 10 times. I said, Mom, she said, I just want to make sure I understand because I don't feel like staying in the ground until Jesus comes. So then I took her to the verse. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But you're going to get your body back, but it's going to come back glorified. Hallelujah. Some of you ladies start fixing your hair. It's going to look better. Glory to God. Notice I didn't say which ladies. Hallelujah. I'm not that dumb, huh? Some of you men, you won't recognize Brother James in heaven. He'll be walking around with an Elvis pompadour. Who's that? Oh, that's James. You remember him? The Bible speaks that we will be renewed and rejuvenated and refreshed. 
And thank God, there will be no sickness, no disease, or any such thing in heaven. Oh, hallelujah. God's going to make everything right. Aren't you happy about that? Everybody lift your hand and say, thank you, Lord. I'm only going to take about four more minutes unless I take another five after that. The thought here is the catching away of the church. The Bible says, we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those in the clouds. Clouds speaks of a myriad of people, not the white clouds that float over your head today. It speaks of the grandstand of heaven that's already gone on before. You're going to see your family again that serve the Lord. You're going to see those that have gone on before you. And we'll be joined together. Now, in the book of Revelation, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation deals with the seven churches of Asia. Those seven churches represent not only the seven ages of the church, but they also represent seven characteristics that are present in every church. So there is a dual meaning to the seven churches. The church of Philadelphia is the church on fire for God. The church of Ephesus was the church that was on fire, but the Bible says they left their first love. They didn't lose it. They just turned around and left it. I forget who I was talking to coming into church tonight about people would depart from the faith. I always believed that meant they'd leave the church, but the truth is there's people that have departed from the faith and they're still sitting in the church pew. Their heart's not on fire for God like it was when Ephesus first experienced that mighty revival under the hands of Paul. When prayer cloths were sent out, de de literally demons were cast out. The sick were healed. And the Bible says all of Asia Minor, both Jew and Greek, heard the gospel. You talk about evangelism. Without television, radio, magazines, books, Paul shook a whole region of the world with the power of God. But 39 years later, when John the Revelator wrote about the church of Ephesus, the church that was born in revival saw devils destroyed, powers and strongholds pulled down, literally thousands upon thousands. Some say the church of Ephesus reached over 20,000 in its attendance, tens of thousands. But in the midst of that, the Bible says they left their first love. When you talk about Bible prophecy, it also causes us to examine ourselves, like we did this morning at communion. Let a man examine himself. Because then you realize the coming of Jesus is closer than we think. How would you live? What would you do if you knew Jesus was coming in the morning? Would to God that all would have that sense. But the truth is, many are just living their life going through form and ritualism, living like the world, doing the things the world does because they don't have what they used to have if they were ever saved. Like Ephesus, they've lost it. But the church of Philadelphia, they're pressing in for more. It's the question then, which church do you want to belong to? The church that's departed from God or the church that's on fire for God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brotherly love, that speaks of Philadelphia. That's the name of the church. Three kinds of love in the Bible. Zoe, God kind of love and God kind of life. Hallelujah. But then there's that area of the eros, which is the erotic, the perverted. And then there is the area of the filio, which is brotherly and sisterly love. May I just suggest to you, as we draw closer to the end, God, like the church of Philadelphia, brotherly love, wants us to show a love and a respect for each other. What do I tell the people that work with me? Pray in tongues every day. Pray in tongues more. Why? Because you build up your most holy faith. This is not a day for less of God. This is a day of more of God. Are you hearing me tonight? So now Iran is facing possible consequence. Again, as I'm 
doing this through Facebook, you that are here, I don't know yet what Israel's response will be. But I will tell you this, that the two main players in Ezekiel 38, we've not heard from them yet. What were the other two nations? They were, as I started to say, this area of Gog, the prince out of the land of Magog and also referred to as Rosh, R-O-S-H, in Ezekiel, has not yet shown its hand. So there might be a timing here, which is why I say I don't believe that what we're seeing is Ezekiel yet. But that could all change in a matter of moments. But when you see Russia begin to emerge along with Turkey and join with Iran, now they've already formed an alliance, much like our NATO, in June of 2022, and it's been ratified by those nations. Russia and Turkey and Iran have already formed an alliance, and they call it that they, uh, uh, one of our presidents previous to this one, I think it was Trump, said the axis of evil. But uh, we understand we're not loved by everybody in the world. But the point I want you to see is this is how close this is becoming prophetically. Again, Russia has not shown their hand yet, neither has Turkey, but it could happen in a moment's time. But I found it interesting. My preacher friend met with some of the guys in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about how he's been invited to the highest levels of the Russian government to consider not just a Christian network, but raising up churches everywhere those stations are at. Are you hearing me? That is unheard of. And so I don't go by the media because the media wants us to hate certain people and love other people, but the Bible says we're to love everybody. And so when people come to me and say, I don't understand why Russia has not been judged by God, it's because before judgment in the Bible, always God gave mercy. And my friend was so shocked that these leaders asked him not only to bring gospel preaching to the nation, but also to raise up churches, that he called two other preacher buddies of mine, said, it's a great opportunity, but I don't know what this is about. And the classic answer was one of my preacher friends said, he said, it's very easy. Go and do it. Go and do it. That's what I would say to you tonight. Whatever God's put before you, don't second guess what God's doing. But believe the anointing of God that's in your life is so strong that all he requires of you is to go and to do what he shows you to do. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be. All of us have been made kings and priests unto God. Are you hearing me? And so we know, we know that we're coming down towards the end. So the question that I've left for the last to answer, is this the war of Ezekiel 38? At this point, I'm going to say to you, no, it's not. But it could be a precursor to what will happen in the days ahead. That time frame, I don't know it. But I've shown you some indications that let us know that God is always on time. And how many times have I preached it? He's not going to let the devil write the last chapter of your life, nor of Bible prophecy or history. God has a plan. And Jeremiah said, I know the plans I have for you. God has a plan for the world. God has a plan for you. And our job is to simply obey what God told us to do. Therefore, that determines the plan unfolding in your life. What did God tell you to do? Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. I say this, my wife will tell you, we say this everywhere. Sometimes when I receive an offering in the, the meetings, I'll say, maybe you can't do it, but you can turn your money into missionary dollars and help us take the gospel to the world. If you'd have told me even 10, 20 years ago that we would be preaching every week 
in 150 nations of the world, translated into the languages of the nations, I'd have looked at you like you're nuts because I had no plan to do that. But God has plans. Tonight at 9 o'clock in Pakistan, our program now is viewed more than any other program in the nation of Pakistan on Sunday night. The owner called me. He said, we're up to 9 million homes and counting that watch the miracles and the things that are doing. If you'd have told me that even five years ago, I had no plan to preach to Muslim people or go to Pakistan. Not that I was opposed to it. But you think about it. I'm a squirrel hunter out of West Virginia. And somehow God uses me. So I tell people, if God can use me, he can use anybody. Hallelujah. Can you imagine? What if the Holy Ghost came on Brother Ronnie Moorhead? He gets on a plane. Where are you going? I don't know, but I'll be back. He goes to a nation, walks out, and just starts praying for the sick, preaching the gospel. And it starts a, a revival, maybe in one of the islands, one of the nations of Europe. We don't know. Someone said, I don't know if I believe that. I know a man that did that, and he's still in ministry today. He just went, and God anointed him. He left his business, and he's still preaching the gospel. You don't know. I'm not saying you're going to leave West Virginia, but you know Fairmont would be a good start. Someone said, what would I do? Well, you got enough empty chairs. We could fill them up, and then we'll look at something else. Everybody has a call of God on their life. And even though, yes, we're living in the end times, yes, there's something going on with Israel and Iran right now, I do not believe this is the battle of Armageddon, nor do I believe it will be, because the temple has to be rebuilt. And before that would happen, you have to have the destruction of the mosque there uh, in Jerusalem. Getting back to David Wilkerson, he felt some kind of an accidental thing could happen and the mosque be destroyed. He said that in Dad's church in the 60s. And I thought, what if one of the 10 missiles that they were sending down on Israel, what if they blew up their own mosque? It would be the only way they wouldn't be mad about it. They did it to themselves. But I'll guarantee if that ever happened, Israel's ready right now to build the temple. And then you saw from Texas, they just sent the first red heifer to Israel. Can have, can't even have one white hair. And that heifer is being kept right now for the first sacrifice. And I saw the uh, uh, thing they built for the keeping of the red heifer by the what they would call the Levitical priests that are still alive. We're close. I said we're very close. Do not allow the pettiness of life and the things that have no major, major effect. Because everything that may be trying you now, I'll guarantee in 100 years, you won't even be thinking about it. So why think about it now? Enjoy your day. Get up and thank God for a new one. My dad always said he got up, checked the newspaper, and if his name wasn't in the obituary, he said, I got dressed. Hallelujah. He had a sense of humor. But the point I'm making to you, don't let the last days be a downer to you, but see yourself anointed by God, not just like those of the Old Testament, but in this dispensation, the Bible speaks of the prophets, the apostles, the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, uh, the pastors, the teachers, and you could go on, and every man, every woman is a preacher of the gospel, and it hurts our Baptist friends, but they were all born of a woman whether they like it or not. Hallelujah. Everybody is somebody to Jesus. You women, I'm telling you, the Bible says in the last days that your women, your daughters shall prophesy. That's in the Bible. The Bible speaks of the women that work with Paul and that they minister much like the apostolic realm. I'm telling you, get ready, ladies. God's going to pour his spirit out upon you. Just increase your praying in tongues. Amen. Praying in the spirit. It's a battle, yes, but it's the battle we win and the devil never wins. And so you say, what about Israel? God's got them in his hand. Hallelujah. He even assigned his number one angel, Michael, to watch over the nation. Michael is the archangel that watches over Israel. Are you hearing me? There
There are angels on assignment. There's God moving in the earth. There is a revival where the waters will cover the sea. There is an outpouring of the Holy Ghost with the Bible says it shall come upon all flesh. Make up your mind which way you're going to look. I'm not looking for what the devil's doing. I'm not looking for the Antichrist or the nations of the world to implode. I'm looking for Jesus Christ who will come back for those that have been faithful to the word of Almighty God. And so in this hour, plant your feet on the bedrock foundation of the scripture and declare, I'm not going anywhere. But Jesus said, behold, I give you power over all the work of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. You talk about an iron dome. We have a Holy Ghost dome. Hallelujah. Everybody stand and lift your hands with me, please. Amen. Someone say, I'm not going anywhere. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands as they come back to the keyboard. Some of the singers. Let's just worship Jesus for a moment again before we go. Singing that song, oh, it is Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus. I want every one of you that want to receive this prayer to get out of your seat, if you will, and come to the altar and allow me, if I can, to pray this blessing upon you. Come on right now as they're getting ready to sing. Move as close as you can. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm trying to be respectful of your time, but we want God to move. Can you say amen? Move in a little closer, please. There's quite a few here tonight. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Little sister, come up here a minute. Do you love me so I won't offend you? This is actually a Hebrew alphabet. Those three things. Did you know that? It is. You know what it spells in the Hebrew? 666. Did you know that? And the word monster might give it away. And then if you look, this here with the thing through it is actually used in... See, the reason I asked her if she loved me because I got to buy her five shirts to replace this one. <laughs> but here's my point. People don't know. They don't know things. And the world will try to jam the spirit of the Antichrist down our throats. When I first saw that, my son and I were talking, Teddy. I said, I'd rather drink Red Bull. And then he was telling me, huh? You just advertised for him. That's wonderful. <laughs> she doesn't even get any royalties. But I remember when she really got in with the Lord and B Brother Billy, I'll call him. And they began to press in. I was so happy for you. That's why I asked. Make sure you still like me. But a preacher has to train, teach, exhort, correct, and sometimes rebuke in love. Do you remember when, who's old enough to remember Nehru jackets with beads? Just Sister Kitty and me. All right. My dad saw me with that on. He ripped the beads off my neck. I thought we were in trouble. He said, you're not a Hindu priest. But that's what had been copied off of when, you know, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism began to sweep into our nation in the 60s, the hippie rebellion. And my dad was on it. He said, we're not a walking billboard for the devil. <laughs> so I've been there, publicly embarrassed by my father, believe it or not. What kind of dad does that to you? But the point I'm making, the devil will try to slip things in, and you have no knowledge of it. And I know she doesn't. She's a very nice lady. You can go down if you feel a little awkward. Hallelujah. <laughs> go stand in the corner. No. <laughs> but folks, we're living in a day that the world is trying to push things. Now, I don't know this guy. I only know what some of my preachers that pastor in, in uh, African-American churches tell me. But there's a guy 
He's a black gentleman. His name is, now I can't remember his name. It's like Cat something. Cat Williams, there you go. He was raised in a Pentecostal home. His parents took him on mission trips to Haiti. Then he backslid, got in the world, and he had these saintness come to him and offer him money if he would take his act and use it to glorify the devil. He said, I may not be serving Jesus, but I ain't that stupid either. And he wouldn't take the money. The other guy that was with him, other two guys, they took it. And now we're hearing about those two fellas on our news. And I can't remember their names either. But he said that was the two others. What did they want him to do? Dedicate their life to push satanic messages in their acts. I'm going to prophesy something to you. God's cleaning Hollywood up right now. I believe that very strongly. He's exposing this pedophilia, all this junk going on. That's the hand of God. The Bible says what is done in darkness, he'll bring it to the light. We're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. What are we supposed to do? Let our light shine. Amen? Do I know you, little lady? You, you seem so nice. Come here, man. Well, let me pray for you real quick. Hallelujah. I'll sit down so you don't feel like I'm lording it over you. I ask the Lord to touch you in your body, in your joints, and in your uh, body. I command no pain to ever set up. Back of your neck, down through your knees, and then one of your hands. Is that right? This one? Let me hold it. Oh, God, heal the woman of a crippling condition. Confirming the word I preached tonight, which is a little unusual for me, but it's still your word. Oh, glory to God. That's the power of God. Come on, lift your hands and praise God with her. Hallelujah. Glory. I said glory. Lift your hand if you want God to touch you tonight. Hallelujah. So three encouragements before we pray. Number one, this is not a day to draw back. This is a day to press in. Number two, if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, ask God to baptize you in the Spirit. And pray in tongues every day. It builds up your faith. And the th third thing, live your life in the light of eternity. Jesus is coming soon. Boy, wouldn't that be something if Ronnie left us instead of going fishing trout in Tennessee? Where's Brother Ronnie? Oh, he went to an island. He's preaching down there. And as soon as they let him out of prison, he'll be home. Hallelujah. Why not? If you got faith for fish, he said, I'll make you fishers of men. Ronnie's always had that anointing and the gift of healing. Thank God for it. Who knows what you've got? But lift your hands and say, Father, I thank you. I'm anointed for your service. And now let's sing it. Come on. Well, oh, it is Jesus. Sing it, singers. Wonderful Jesus. Well, yes, it is Jesus. In my soul. For I have touched. For I have touched. No. Hallelujah. And his blood has well made me whole. I tried and I tried to come to Jesus. I pressed through the crowd and touched him that day. Virtue flowed out of Jesus and touched me. Now I am every bit whole. Come on, sing it the chorus. Oh, it is Jesus. Well, wonderful Jesus. Well, yes, it is Jesus in my soul. Well, for I have touched the hem of his 
his garment and his blood and his blood has made me whole. This book that I taught a little bit out of, Coming Invasion of Israel. Where's Tina Moody? I saw her here. There she is. See this? How many know who Tina is? If you go to her after church, because aren't we offering this on television in May for free? If you go to her, she'll get your free copy. This is yours now. You don't have to wait till May. And I command you to be whole the rest of your life in those joints. No arthritis setting up. God heal the knee. Amen. Also, the beginning of infection in your bladder is being healed. And the Lord is making you whole. Hallelujah. That's the word of the Lord, sister. Hallelujah. How many of you believe it? Now, I know the Holy Spirit, how he works. How many, as I'm teaching this, a conviction, you feel the Spirit putting his finger on something in your life. And you say, you know what? I got to change that. Let me see your hand. Be honest. The Spirit was speaking to you, and I just lift and hold it high. Because I, I knew he was putting one on me. Amen. <laughs> but we're getting ready to fast and pray Monday through Friday for people, for our nation, for the camp meeting that's coming up. The Lord told me this year, he said, I want you to preach every night. My wife will tell you, I said, I don't want to preach every night. I said, we got other people, but I did feel that. I haven't done that in 20 years. The Lord said, I want you to turn the camp meeting into a healing meeting every night. So in obedience to him, that's what I'm doing. And that's why we're fasting and praying. We're going to believe God for miracles. As soon as I said yes, that same day, a pastor called me from Canada. My wife's been diagnosed with cancer in uh, uh, her body. And he said, we're coming to that camp meeting. We're believing God to heal her. He said, she's too young to go. And I said, I agree with you. So the word's getting out. Help us get the word out locally. I've talked to my buddy Sam Alloy, Donnie, different guys that are coming from around here. People need God's power. Say that with me. People need God's power. God's power. And make it personal. Say, I need, I need God's, power. God's power. Now let's all lift our hands. Father, whatever it is, your Holy Spirit put his finger on in these wonderful people. I command this stronghold, this place that Satan is trying to use to pull us down to be broken right now in the anointing. Just like you broke the spirit of arthritis off that woman a moment ago. Break! I pray every stronghold the enemy is trying to use to water down the gospel of Jesus in the hearts of the people. We want to be ready when you come. When that trumpet sounds, we want to be found faithful. Oh, Jesus, don't let one soul miss it. But let all of us obey the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I feel like somebody you're battling, you're not sure that you're saved. I don't know who that would be, but if you feel like, Brother Shuttlesworth, I, I'm not sure I'm ready. Just lift your hand right where you're at. And we're going to pray. I feel it right now. Don't put it off. You're dealing with the area. Am I saved? Am I ready? You can get ready tonight. A couple of you. All right, let's pray it out loud to everybody. Father... In Jesus' name, we covenant at this holy altar. We shall be ready for when you come again. Satan, you'll not destroy us. You'll not keep us from God's best. But we covenant with the Lord to live a life that's pleasing unto him. From this night forward, I boldly declare, I will. Live, live for, Jesus for Jesus Christ all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And if you're glad about that, lift both your hands while Brother Jonathan's coming back. Hallelujah. Just thank him, thank him, thank him. Come on, lift your voice. Thank him. 
Thank the Lord, I'm going to be ready. Thank the Lord, I'm going to be ready. Thank the Lord, I'm washed in the blood. Thank the Lord, the power of the Holy Ghost is helping me. Thank the Lord that when that trumpet sounds, we're going to rise up and join the many in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let the church shout loudly, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout it again, Hallelujah. hallelujah. Say praise to God. Hallelujah. That's what it means. Amen. Well, pastor's been texting my son-in-law, and uh, he said, give me the mic at the end. Watch it. This may be the only time you ever see it. You got it. Well, praise the Lord. What a wonderful word we received tonight. Amen. If you would, before we dismiss, return to your seats. We're going to receive an offering, a special offering for Brother Ted and his ministry. Pastor Head specifically messaged me and asked me to do this this evening. How many of you received that this evening? Amen. You know, the Bible says in the book of Matthew that he who receives a prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. And so, as you partake of this offering this evening, there is a reward that is released to you because you've received the word of God. Can you say amen? And so, if you will... Go ahead and prepare a gift. Before we do, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in the earth. Father, we thank you that you hold everything in the palm of your hand. You know exactly when you're going to send Christ back to the earth to catch us away. In that meantime, Father, may this word dwell in our hearts, burn like a mighty fire in the mighty name of Jesus, so that we'd make impact for the kingdom. We ask you, Lord, right now, help us to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit tonight in our giving, and whatever you'd have the people to give, as we're all obedient to that word, we thank you, Lord, that more than enough will come in, every need is supplied in Jesus' name. So, Father, I ask that you begin to speak to the people now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you're watching online and you'd like to give, you can go to tedshuttlesworth.com forward slash give. tedshuttlesworth.com forward slash give if you'd like to give in this offering. And then, of course, if you're a part of this church, your tithe comes to this house and you'd like to give, just designate that in the offering. Other than that, everything you give this evening will go to Brother Ted. Are you ready to give? Everybody obedient to the Lord tonight. Amen. Well, you can go ahead and stand up. This is going to be our dismissal. And so, thank you, Lord, that everything that we sow in obedience, it comes back in a mighty harvest in Jesus' name. Have a wonderful evening. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night.